afternoon, my name is Cameron Cole. I am the uh, founding chairman of Rooted Ministry and I'm the director of Children, Youth, and Family at the Cathedral Church of the Advent in Birmingham, Alabama. And I, I really am grateful for the opportunity to get to talk to you guys uh, today about, um, uh, about evangelism. The language of evangelism is the title of this talk. And I think that, um, you know, w one thing that's very, very important uh, as we try to communicate the gospel, we try to disciple kids, is uh, that we're using terms, we're using language uh, that people understand. Uh, what we mean is what they understand. And, you know, I want to start with a story. I, I one time hired uh, a person and I interviewed them, and this was for a very small position. This was not a not a, uh, a pastoral position where they were teaching the Bible or sharing the gospel. It was, it was for, uh, you know, a couple hours a week, a support role kind of thing. Anyhow, after we started, um, after about six months into the job, uh, and, and by the way, when I, when I interviewed them, that you know, we talked about the gospel, we talked about grace, we talked about Jesus, and you know, we really were, seemed like we were on the same page. Well, after about six months, this person came to me and said, you know, I, I, I think we're on different pages here, and I'm not sure if this is really, this is gonna work out. And I said, what do you mean? And what I came to find out is that he was, effectively, he was a, he was a universalist. Uh, he did attend church, um, but he didn't necessarily believe that Christianity was true or that Jesus was the Son of God or that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. He, he just he liked um, practicing universalism within a Christian context. And so if you had been present at that interview that I had done, you would have said, yeah, this guy is a you know, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, uh, gospel uh, Christian. And in reality, he 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 was not, nor did he personally identify himself in that way. Uh, and it was a it was a, a problem of language. Uh, we were we were using certain terms, Jesus and grace and gospel, uh, but we were meaning different things. And so, uh, what I want to talk about today is is some of the the words that we use, what we mean by them, um, is different than what people receive. And so, at the heart of this talk. Um, is this concept of what you call illocutionary force uh, and illocutionary effect. So illocutionary uh, force is what a speaker intends to communicate to a hearer. Um, illocutionary effect is what they actually hear, what they actually receive. So and for example, uh, you know, I, uh, and early in my marriage, my wife uh, said to me, honey, the garbage can is full. Uh, now, all the all the wives, if if you're listening to this and you're a wife, you're you're probably starting to laugh. Uh, I, as a male, um, what I heard was it's a statement of fact that the garbage can is full. That that's nice, honey. Yes, the garbage can is full. That was the elocutionary effect. What I heard. However, her elocutionary force, what she intended to communicate, was, honey, take out the garbage. Uh, but her, her force and my effect. Uh, there was an impasse there. There was a disconnect where what she intended to communicate was not what I heard. And so um, I, I to give you another example kind of from a youth ministry context. Uh, one time I had a speaker who is a solid, orthodox, uh, evangelical Christian. Um, and he, uh, but he didn't do a whole lot of work with young people, uh, particularly with middle school kids. And so he was talking about uh, Psalm 34, 7, delight yourself in the Lord and he will grant you the desires of your heart. But the way he communicated that was love Jesus and then do as you please. Love Jesus and do as you please. Now, what he meant by that is if you love Jesus, God will uh, in time transform your desires such that the desire of your heart will be to obey God's law. That, that's kind of what he was trying to communicate. But what is it you think that a bunch of seventh graders heard? What they heard was, oh, if I love Jesus, I can do whatever I want. Uh, and God's law is of no consequence and doesn't matter. And uh, that's obviously not, not what he was trying to communicate theologically. That's obviously not what the Bible says. Um, but um, his, because of uh, a lack of precision in the terms he was using and the language he was using, um, there was a major communicative impasse in uh, the elocutionary force, what he was trying to communicate, and the elocutionary effect, what the kids actually heard. And so what I'd like to do is look at five words um, that, uh, where I think there is a, a big risk um, in elocutionary force and elocutionary effect, where there's a big risk for there being a communicative impasse. And these are, these are terms that are instrumental uh, and essential 
in evangelism, or at least their concepts that are instrumental. Uh, and so I want to walk through those words um, and then give a couple of examples of how we can prevent a lack of clarity, um, a lack of clarity in evangelism and in uh, teaching the Bible and teaching theolo- theology to kids. Um, the, 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 the five terms are going to be God, Christian, sin, believe, and repent. Uh, and I'm going to go through these a little more quickly than you'd probably like, but we're going to provide, I've got a workshop for you, a worksheet for you there um, that hopefully can give you a little more depth. First word is God. Now, when we are talking about God and evangelism, like you have a relationship with God or you trust God with your life, we are talking about the triune God of the Bible, uh, the God who is perfectly holy and a God who is gracious and loving, right? Um, that is what we intend to communicate. However, a lot of times in the culture, um, you know, God can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people depending on their background or depending on the geography where they live. Uh, you know, for some people in some regions, when they hear God, that may refer to some greater life force that oversees the scientific processes of the universe. Or I think in most cases in this culture, most people, what they have in mind with God is uh, a universalistic, all-loving God uh, that is the God of your own understanding. So basically it's, you know, a God who's loving, who certainly uh, is not, does not judge and certainly does not uh, send people to hell. Uh, and, you know, the character and nature of that God is kind of dependent upon what you think. You know, I think God is this, I think God is that. Uh, and this God, um, you know, it's, it's, it, there are many paths to this God. So when we're talking about God, um, we need to be really careful that we're making clear that we are talking about the God of the Bible. Uh, in particular, I think it's important that people know that this is a God who is holy and just uh, and a God who is loving and forgiving. I'll give you an example of, of how this can go wrong. There's a quote here um, from uh, a politician. They did an interview about their religious beliefs. This is from about 15 years ago. And this politician identified themselves as a Christian. Uh, and they also um, said that they had, uh, at a point in their life, gone down front to receive Christ as their Savior uh, and prayed the sinner's prayer. But listen to how they talk about God. Um, this, this, this person says, uh, I am rooted in the, in, the, in the Christian tradition. I believe that there are many paths to the same place and that there is a higher power that we are connected as a people. This is something that I'm sure I've had serious debates with my fellow Christians about. I think that the difficult thing about any religion, including Christianity, is at some level, there's a call to evangelize and proselytize. There's a belief, certainly in some quarters, that people haven't embraced Jesus Christ as their Savior. They're going to hell. I find it hard to believe that my God would consign four-fifths of the world to hell. I can't imagine that my God would allow a little Hindu kid in India who never interacts with the Christian faith to somehow burn for all eternity. That's just not part of my religious makeup. So you can see that he identifies as a Christian, but the, the God um, that he is identifying with uh, is really a universalistic God because he says, uh, I believe there are many paths to the same place. Uh, and so, you know, he may have been uh, in a, you know, a, a, a gospel preaching church. He may have been led into, uh, you know, to pray the sinner's prayer. But the God that he kind of signed up for, the God who he pledged his allegiance to is not the God of the Bible. <laughs> Uh, and so, so that, that, that's just an example here. Um, a second term is the word Christian. Uh, and, you know, I, would, I honestly would really kind of encourage people in, in sharing the gospel to steer away from using the word Christian. Uh, you know, if you live in, in some parts of America, particularly, say, like the West Coast, you know, being a Christian, that may mean that you're a uh, homophobic, anti-science, anti-intellectual person who's a bigot. Uh, and, and, you know, you, I, would, I would encourage people to not ask a person, would you like to become a Christian? Because what that means to them may be something totally different. They may say, no, I don't, I don't hate gay people. No, I, 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 you know, I, I majored in biology in college. No, I, I, I'm, I have a brain. No, I don't want to be a Christian. And so, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, and, and then other parts of the country, particularly like the Bible Belt, um, you see that a lot of times for people what it means to be a Christian is, that they just, they were baptized as a baby or uh, they were confirmed at a church or they attend a church on Christmas and Easter. And so it's more of a cultural identification. They say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, in reality, they might identify themselves as a Christian, but they don't have a uh, saving faith in Jesus Christ and they don't follow him as their Lord. And so I think the word Christian is, is uh, not a helpful word to use in evangelism. There is almost, um, almost always a... Um, 
almost always a, a communicative impasse when that word comes up. Third word uh, would be the word sin. You know, when we talk about sin, when we look at sin in the Bible, we can look at sin at three different levels. Uh, we can look at sin, well, actually more than that, but I wanna, I'm going to focus on three. Um, uh, one level, we can talk about sin at the behavioral level, where it's a violation of God's law. Uh, uh, it's a transgression. A second level we talk about sin is at the relational level, um, where as a product of our rebellion uh, and our desire to be our own Savior and our own Lord, um, there is a, a separation between us and God. There's a broken relationship. So we can talk about sin in the, and the, sorry, in the uh, relational uh, realm. And then in a third way we can talk about sin is theologically. Uh, and so uh, sin, when we're talking about it theologically, uh, is our desire to be our own savior and our own Lord. Like we want to be the person who is in control of our life. And, you know, I think that, you know, for a person to come to come into saving relationship with Jesus, they, they have to acknowledge that they're a sinner. Um, they have to acknowledge that uh, there's a break in their relationship with God and that they have, you know, tried to be the Lord of their own life and that that needs to be remediated. They need to repent. Um, and so, but so when we talk about sin, we need to it's a, we need to use that word, but we need to define our terms. I think there's one thing I really want to get across in this talk, is that we cannot use Christianese. We cannot use Christian jargon that that we as insiders use um, without defining our terms. Like it's fine to use the term God. It's fine to use the word sin, but you need to make clear what you mean by those terms. You need to explain the concept behind them. So, uh, so you know, with sin, I think a lot of times people think of sin as doing something really bad, like murdering somebody. Um, or, you know, you see in the culture that, you know, most people kind of think of right and wrong uh, in, in, in relative terms. Like that, that kind of depends on their standards that they develop themselves. You look at the um, horrific, diabolical song, Take Me to Church by Hozier, and he says, my church offers no absolutes. So he's basically saying like, there's no absolute truth. You know, what's right and wrong is basically what I determined to be right and wrong. And so, um, uh, and so with that being said, I really, when I talk about sin, um, I, I will say, especially in terms of evangelism, I'll say sin is our desire to be our own savior and our own Lord, um, to be the God of our own life. And I think, you know, uh, that, that's very much consistent with what sin is, especially if you look at Genesis 3, the original sin of Adam and Eve. Um, that, you know, what the lie they bought into is that they could be like God. They could be their own God. They could be their own Savior. Um, they could live a self-sufficient line apart from depending on the Lord. And um, when, I, uh, when I communicate the gospel to someone, I, you know, I think a lot of secular people, while they might not necessarily believe that they're a sinner from a standpoint of done anything really wrong or uh, broken rules, I, I think they would be pretty clear that they are the Lord of their own life that they're the one in control and that God is not in control of their life. And so I generally uh, tend to talk about sin in theological terms first to help them get a sense that, um, you know, uh, what I'm talking about with sin is that you're the Lord of your own life and what you really need is for Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life. So that's our third term. Two more terms, and we're not going to spend quite as much time on these. Uh, I'm going to gloss over them. But uh, the fourth term is believe. Um, you know, when we say believe, uh, that word has just really been kind of corrupted in the culture. I think um, what, you know, most kids, most people think of when they hear believe is just intellectual assent. Um, you know, that, 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 that you kind of, um, that you assent to the factuality of a proposition. Um, or a, a lot of times people, when they think about belief, uh, it means believing in some supernatural mythology. Uh, and, you know, when we talk about belief, uh, saving belief, there is a part of it that's intellectual assent. Um, we do actually, we do intellectually agree that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, um, that he died for our sins. We do buy into the Christian narrative that we see in the Bible. Uh, but on top of that, belief really, if, from a standpoint of saving faith, means that you no longer are trusting in yourself and your own moral and religious performance, but instead you are trusting in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're trusting in the grace of God that's come uh, through the gospel. And so, um, so you know, I, I think that when we talk about belief, um, I, I, we have to define that. And I think one, one important way to do that um, is I say, I always make sure to say that, you know, you need to come to a place where you no longer trust in yourself, you no longer believe in your moral and religious performance, but instead 
you believe in and you trust in the religious, the, the performance of Jesus Christ and his life, death, and resurrection. And so, um, I, honestly, I think the word trust uh, in our modern parlance is more helpful than the word believe, because trust tends to have a little more of a personal, relational connotation to it in the present day. Um, you know, a, a lot of times people think of belief as like, I believe in the Easter Bunny, or I believe in Santa Claus. Um, we're not talking about that. We're talking about you're trusting in another person's performance. You're trusting in the grace that comes from God rather than trusting in yourself. And last, um, the word repent. Uh, I think that most people, you know, a lot of people don't know what this word means at all. Um, but even people who may have some background in the Christian faith, but they're not, a, not a, they're not actually a follower of Jesus, um, they think of repent as to stop doing bad things. Uh, and you know, re- repentance, and when we talk about um, say, you know, repentance that comes with belief for for salvation, is a turning away from self-reliance and turning toward reliance in Christ. Um, and so. Um, so yeah, I, I think that we, we, that's another term that we really uh, have to define for people. I think that's true of all of these things. We have to define our terms. You know, it's interesting, jargon is something that is used in industries like the legal industry uh, and in accounting to keep people out. Uh, you know, part of the reason that lawyers have their jobs, no offense lawyers, uh, is because the language and contracts and, and whatnot is so impossible for an untrained person to understand that you really have to reply on an attorney. You have to hire an attorney to work through those kind of things. We don't want that to be, well, that's not what we're trying to do, um, you know, as a youth ministry and as a church. Like, we want to bring people in to the family of God. We want to bring people in to union with Christ. And so, you know, given that jargon typically uh, is meant to keep people out, we need to make sure that, you know, if we use our Christian terminology, that we're defining every term so that people know what we're talking about and so that they're buying into true saving faith and they're buying into a relationship with uh, the God of the Bible, um, you know, the, 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 the Lord um, Jesus Christ. And so finally, I just, I want to, um, I want to uh, look at one last thing. And there, there are two um, evangelism models that uh, I, I'm not going to go through both of them, but there are two evangelism models that um, you know can help that I, that I think do a good job of using um, effective language and terminology uh, to to be clear about the gospel um, and to define um, to define uh, the terms of the terms of Christian theology really really clearly. And one of these is called Two Ways to Live. Uh, this is what it looks like the sheet that you have there on the table. But um, Two Ways to Live comes out of the Diocese of Sydney in Australia. And, um, and it's, uh, it's basically, I, I think it's just in practical purposes, I think it's effective because it has, you know, this diagram, these pictures. And, you know, as you're, this, this is what we first teach students um, how to share the gospel. We use this because they can draw pictures and they're kind of, it's very organized so and so forth. But just to give you an example of Two Ways to Live, how... Um, and how it makes clear the, the concepts of the gospel. Um, you know, it starts out talking about how we initially lived under God's rule. And then when we get to the second box here, it shows that it, it just talks about sin and it talks about the fall, not saying that Adam and Eve did bad things, but Adam and Eve, mankind, wanted to be their own king. And you can kind of see the little crown over here. And so they're talking about sin um, in terms of wanting to be uh, your own savior and your own Lord, wanting to do life on your own apart from trusting in God. Uh, And so I think that's one example of how um, they are careful, careful with their language, um, careful with their language. Another example too is in, in the third box, they talk about judgment that comes as a product of sin. You know, they say God, God, basically God is the king and we're, you know, you have a bunch of people who are trying to be the king. You know, God, God says, you know, he wants to give us a chance to say, hey, you're not the king, I'm the king. And you need to, you need to submit to me. Um, and they say, you know, God will not allow us to try to climb on his throne forever. Ultimately, when we die, um, God will, um, God will uh, judge us 
for trying uh, for our sin and trying to be our own Savior and our own Lord. And so they talk about the holiness of God. They are clear about who the God is that we're talking about. And then when they talk about the gospel, when they talk about Jesus, they talk about the mercy and forgiveness of God. But they're making clear that you're not signing up for the universalist God of your understanding. You are signing up for the triune God of grace who is uh, attested to uh, in the Bible and through the person of Jesus Christ. And so that's just an example where you see... um, you can see this done well. And so I'm going to stop there uh, and kind of wrap it up. But I think, you know, some bottom line parting thoughts here um, are, uh, you know, what I really kind of want you to walk away with is to be sensitive to the language that you use um, in in sharing the gospel with people, uh, you know, with kids, and as you teach Christian, Christian theology. Even to kids who are, um, even to kids who have been in the church their whole lives, you know, they, they still a lot of times struggle to know what certain terms mean or they have a false understanding. And so if we just use jargon, we can let kids, you know, sit in their, um, their you know, false understandings um, and that's not very helpful. And so, you know, I think one thing is anytime you use any kind of Christian jargon, um, you need to define it. Every time I use the word gospel, I will, you know, say, you know, talking about the gospel, God's love for sinners through Christ. Um, I always want to have that phrase to follow it to make sure I'm defining it so it's clear what the gospel is. So, so you know, defining our terms is really, really important. Um, and uh, making sure that we are um, explaining our concepts in such a way that there's not a communicative impasse, that what the elocutionary force, what we intend to communicate is what people actually hear because um, we're clear and fully explaining um, our what we mean with the terms that we're using. And so um, thanks so much for listening. Thanks for coming to a Rooter Regional Group. Um, y- y'all are just such a blessing, such a blessing uh, to the Rooted Movement. Um, we appreciate that you know, some of you are volunteers, some of you are part-time, some of you are just working really, really hard. and. Um, and some of you are really encouraged, and no matter what you know, what your 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 um, no matter what your place is, what you are doing is just so 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 critical um, for the you know for the for the, to the kingdom. It's it's critical to the future of, of wherever you live, and um, you know you carry the word of life. Uh, you carry the word of grace uh, in a world where kids don't don't really hear a whole lot of grace. Uh, they don't hear a whole lot of authentic love. Um, where they are loved apart from their performance. And you know, truly, Jesus is the only one who can love them like that. So um, God bless you. And uh, thanks again for being a part of the Rooted Movement. Uh, and let me finish with a prayer. Lord God, um, you know our hearts, you know our every need. Uh, and we pray that you would provide your grace to us. Give us boldness in sharing the gospel. Give us opportunities to lead people to Christ. And pray that uh, the people that we are around, the kids who are in our youth groups, the families we're around, Pray that your Holy Spirit would do a work in their hearts, that they would desire to know your truth, but most of all, they would desire to know and love and serve you, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.